Hello, everyone. Thank you for sticking with us. This is the last session of the conference, um, Surviving Lunch. Hopefully you've had some coffee. Um, we are here um, talking about youth literature today. Um, several of us are involved in a project called the Data Sitters Club that you'll be hearing about um, in various different ways. Um, we also have, have other talks looking at youth literature. Um, there's so much richness there in terms of um, you know, youth literature across time, across space, and translation. Um, but remarkably, there hasn't been an awful lot of work done on it um, in DH circles and increasingly uh, people uh, in, in you know, doing English literature from the perspective of, of youth like are, are moving towards the direction of digital humanities um, but as, as far as we could tell this is this is maybe the first ever panel on youth literature at the DH conference so progress um, all right so we'll we'll be uh, each doing our talks and then we'll, we'll have uh, we'll all get up here and have a discussion at the end um, and I hope you enjoy it as much as we have enjoyed working on these things so take it take it away Yona Thank you, Quinn, for introducing our work, and also thank you for inviting me to do this. Um, uh, my background is in translation studies and stylometry, um, but my geeky part was always very enthusiastic about uh, reading uh, youth literature and so on. So I was very happy when uh, Quinn and other data sitters uh, club members started gathering these collections of texts, uh, because it's a really wonderful data set, a data set of uh, many, many books and many, many translations of these books into various languages. And if you know something about stylometry, you know we get pretty excited when, uh, when comparable corpora, parallel corpora are created. Um, so starting with a little bit of theory, um, our work with this project, our work with um, stylometric inv uh, investigations into translation is so how the language of the books, uh, books is changing depending on the language we are reading it in. Um, our, observa our observations were based on uh, Lawrence Venuti's uh, theory that uh, translated text uh, is often uh, deemed uh, accept acceptable and successful when the translator is not at all visible, so that the translator style should be hidden as much as possible. And uh, this is something that's been bugging stylometrists for quite a while now. Like, are the translators really invisible? Because if we can detect uh, collaborations, if we can detect authorship uh, and so on, can we, uh, we for sure have to be able to find some uh, traces of translators at least, and this is what we were trying to do here. Our research question with this project was, um, um, was twofold. So one thing was uh, that we were wondering if we can detect translator style, as I've already mentioned. But another question was also that in the process of collecting, um, of collecting the books, um, Quinn discovered that, uh, that many of the books were ghostwritten, in fact. And the question of the impact of ghostwriters is always very interesting, because if somebody is writing per order of the uh, original offer, um, does it mean that they are able to mimic their style so closely that nobody will, able, uh, will be able to tell the difference? Or is it still that you cannot really fool uh, the algorithms and so on? So these were our two questions uh, here. And we already knew from uh, various, um, various studies on translator style uh, that this will be difficult, probably. Uh, our other goals were to uh, continue applying DH methods to this wonderful corpus of the Data Sitters Club that was created by a large group of scholars uh, and um, has been exciting um, scholars all around the world. I mean, these are the books that many of us read when we were children or when we were teenagers, and it's super cool that we can examine them now and we can look at them in translation. Um, the other goal of this was also that uh, with Data Sitters Club, uh, the goal is always to explain different digital methods in easy terms so that people can replicate them to make, uh, to not only collect the books and the translations, but also enable other scholars uh, to learn the methodology um, by following um, relatively easy um, explanations and tutorials. Uh, in our data set, uh, we've had 
132 translations of uh, Babysitter's Club novels um, that were made into six language versions. In fact, more translations are available, but um, we decided to introduce some thresholds for which um, uh, over which we would analyze the books, like if there were only one or two or three translations available, we couldn't really do uh, this kind of research with stylometric methods examining influences of various translators. But for a number of languages, we've had quite big collections of translations which made it possible. Uh, a little bit about The Babysitter's Club. It's a series of middle grade novels written by Anna Martin. Um, these books were published um, in the late 80s to 2000s and um, they touched upon a group of, uh, now we would probably call them twins, uh, uh, twin girls uh, who, um, twin in the sense of, uh, of age, um, or girls who were taking care of children in their neighborhood, earning a little money and just building friendships, experiencing any kind of stuff you can experience as a, as a young person. They were funny, they were sometimes serious and dark, um, but in general they touched upon various topics. Uh, so that was our data set. And when it comes to the method, we relied on the stylometric methods of analyzing big literary collections, um, using not just text, but also metadata and research literature. So in our case, uh, for this study, um, apart from just doing our analysis on text, we also had to learn a little bit about translators, about the publishing houses and the methods that they were applying, which were sometimes controversial, let's say. Uh, we are also following these methods because they have been observed to um, help us analyze literature and language uh, in a way objectively. This is not a term we very much like these days, but, um, but looking at the texts from the distance, at the relations between the texts, can help us understand, um, understand it better as well. Uh, in our case, this was stylometry uh, with a couple of very, very simple, very basic methods. Uh, hierarchical clustering in the form of cluster analysis. We also followed with bootstrap consensus tree, which is a method of, um, of combining a series of, uh, of um, cluster analysis together to find the average uh, of all of the connections made in different uh, methodological settings. And we used network um, uh, visualizations and additional te uh, tests for um, network tests for modularity with Louvain algorithm uh, so that we could detect the strong communities within the whole group of texts, not just by what we uh, see and uh, we think is strong connections, but also by, by what is visible in the, uh, in the calculations. We used uh, 100 to 1,000 most frequent words and uh, primarily focused on cosine delta, even though we also experimented with other methods. And um, we examined English, French, in three language variants, Italian, Polish, and Spanish. Uh, interestingly for that, we also uh, tried applying culling methods, so the method of choosing just the words that are shared across um, a given percent of all of the books in our corpus for English and for French, because for French, given the three language variants, uh, we had quite a big participation of um, French translations from Canada, from Quebec. And uh, we thought that the reason why they were behaving slightly odd might be related to the dialect and then using culling would, um, would take this effect away, but in fact, you will learn in a moment if it was so. Um, so you can find all the details um, on the website with more results and so on. Um, we also ha already have a paper out uh, on that topic, uh, but now to show you some cool stuff. So this network that you're seeing now is a network of all of the babysitters' books that were digitized um, by the Data Sitters Club um, project. Um, this is 142 novels, if I remember correctly. And uh, here the colors correspond to the strongest communities that were detected. So it doesn't matter who would be the author, it matters like what are the strongest similarities between the texts. And if you, uh, I hope when I turn you can still hear me, but um, yeah, so if you look at this, oh, sorry. 
clumsy. Uh, if you look at this violet um, cluster on the right, this is actually books by Anne Martin. Um, like all of the books are by Anne Martin, but these are the books that we know for sure that she wrote. Whereas the other colors correspond to various ghostwriters. And this made us quite excited because even though we know that ghostwriters were doing their best to imitate her style, we can still see that their style is also visible. Uh, it's not that it's completely far away from the books, but um, individual ghostwriters would have their own footprints, if you want to call it this way. One example here is that uh, in the big purple um, cluster, um, there are a few points by one of the future ghostwriters, and you can see uh, that uh, some of the points in the purple cluster seem to be leaning strongly to, to the other ghostwriter, Corpra. And we believe that this was likely caused by um, either higher um, degree of um, the offer the, um, of the ghostwriter trying to imitate the offer style, or the fact that often offers in the first stages of ghostwriting procedures and so on tend to be more um, inter intervening more when it comes to editing and so on. So this is, there are two explanations around this and we would need to uh, um, gather Anne Martin to explain this probably. Um, so this is the case of the French translations that we thought was very interesting because here you can clearly see the dialect patterns. And no matter what we did with this, no matter how hard we tried to break it, eliminate dialect markers and so on, Quebecois translations are always, um, these are the, the purple ones again, uh, they are always quite different from the continental French, uh, European French uh, translations. Uh, interestingly, also, the European French translations uh, tend to group very closely together, and um, uh, linguistic investigations into this, well, not even linguistic, literary history investigations into this, um, led Quinn and uh, our colleagues who are making French collections to find out that, uh, that uh, Belgian translations, which were first, when they were taken by the French publishing house, slightly altered and published without translators' names. Uh, so we are not really certain who was the person who was doing the interventions for French French, but we know that these books are very strongly resembling the Belgian translations and that they were likely just remodeled by the publishing house. Uh, in the Polish translations, the situation is, uh, is quite different because there are not so many of them. Um, right now, they are still publishing them, so uh, we could add another book, but uh, this was a study we did last summer. Uh, so first, we had um, one translator who did um, three books in the 90s, and these books um, were good translations, but they also employed some more intravenous practices like uh, some of the concepts of American teenage life were foreign to Polish readers at the time. I mean, this was just after the fall of the Iron Curtain and uh, all of the Eastern Europe opening to, uh, to American culture. So the names of Swedes, for example, would be followed by explanations what kind of Swedes these are. For new translations that were done in the last five, six years, this practice is not necessary. We also cannot really see the translator here. Uh, uh, even though the old translations from the 19th were done by a different person uh, than now, but we see that still the strongest signal here is individual books. So the first book will always group together, the second group will always group together, and quite interestingly for us also, we can see these patterns later on, like, um, like, uh, Four and a, sorry, uh, fourth and the fifth book will be strongly together, eighth and ninth and so on. So there seem to be more thematic and book related connections rather than the translations imp uh, translators impact. And um, our last examples, uh, Spanish and Italian, this is where things start to get very interesting. Uh, in Spain, um, Spain was one of the uh, first countries to adopt translations and there were quite many of them, um, done by a few translators and here we can actually start to see our translators. This is not, you know, super visible impact, but if you look at the thickness of connections between 
um, these texts and then these texts and these texts, um, these were all done by different people. So actually, um, the translations by a given translator would group more strongly. Um, the connections between them were, they would be more similar than any textual features related to the content of the books. Um, and this was our first case to discover so. Uh, and similarly, it is in Italian. Um, here also you can see these triangles or, um, or um, rectangular forms of similar texts, uh, like this is one translator, this is another translator, this is another translator, and um, this was quite interesting to us because we thought, what if this is actually uh, language circle related, um, that some translators are more visible than others, and in some language circles it seems more uh, permittable to show your style as a translator. Like, um, I have my background in, uh, in Poland in translation studies, and our school is quite formalized. We are expected to make no personal traces, but apparently it doesn't necessarily happen in all languages. Um, it, it was also quite interesting for us to find that language variant carries strong sig uh, stylistic signal, and that ghostwriters are visible almost as well as the original offers, even when they are translated. Because also in the translations we could see um, the small groupings related to ghostwriters. So on my end, that is it for now, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Hello, my name is Agnieszka Bachmann. I'm a postdoc at Uppsala University. Usually I work on medieval manuscripts, but I also have a background in translation studies, which has come in handy studying the Swedish Babysitters Club books. I'm going to be talking about the relationship between the paratextual changes uh, in the translation of the books and how faithful the translation is. But first, a little bit about the translations. There are 16 different books that have been translated, published in three discrete time periods between 1989 and 1999 by two publishers and worked on by five translators. If you, by chance, know anything about Swedish youth literature, you will recognize the red spines of Bea Wallström's Ungdomsböcke, which signified books for girls while books for boys had green spines. But Wallström didn't publish all the Swedish BC, BSC books. Uh, the white and green books in the picture are published by Fjellklubben, owned by Stab and Felt, and both are publishers with a focus on youth literature. The first six books were translated and published under the series name Våran Klubb, by Bea Wallström in 1989 to 1990. A few years later, in 1992, the series was continued by T.L. Klubman, which first reissued the first book and then continued with books 7 through 11 in 1993. The series was now called Barnbachsklubben. Six years later, in 1999, Bea Wallström again was publishing the series, and they chose an assortment of books from later in the English series, six books between number 50 and 63. This time the series was called The Babysitter's Club. Voran Club has three translators credited, um, and the other two have one each. Um, for a children's series, having many translators is not that unusual. The first book wasn't retranslated. The same translator is credited in both versions, and the translation is very similar, but there are some systematic changes um, which speak to a possible publisher norm. And you can see a few of them here. Um, the biggest and most eye-catching difference between the eight, 1989 version and 1992 versions is that the first book 
uh, has changed the names of three of the four main characters. In English, we have Christy, Marianne, Claudia, and Stacy, which became Christy, Marie, Cindy, and Sara. Whereas in the 1992 reissue, the kids keep their English names. It's hard to speculate about why the names were changed as they were, and why, for example, Marianne didn't become the well-known Swedish name Marianne except maybe Marianne in circa 1990 would have been of the wrong generation. Um, it should have been maybe an older teacher rather than a kid. Uh, Marie without the E on the end though, born in the late 70s is right on trend. Claudia being changed to Cindy is really hard to say. Maybe it was more a more well-known English name because of the Cindy doll or the supermodel. And Sara was also a very common name for kids at this time. Almost all of the human names were kept the same. Uh, we have Buddy, Marnie, Susie, Morbida Destiny, aka Mrs. Potter, uh, who the kids believe is a witch. There are a few pet names that have uh, been changed. For example, Buffy and Pinky have become Brunis and Brödis. While well, later in the series, we meet Don Schaefer, whose first name is kept as is, Don, uh, or as my uh, friend used to pronounce it, Davn. But at first, her last name is written as Schaefer with S-H without the C, though her family in the same book is written as Schaefer uh, with the a umlaut, uh, which I found hilarious since Schaffer is the Swedish word for German uh, shepherd dogs. This is by translator number three of Våren Club, Katarina Vest. In the following books, now in the Barnbachsklubben era, Don's family name is consistently changed to Schaffer. And for the last six translated books, her name is the same as an English Schaefer. To go back to two versions of the first book, we can see that the 1989 version, uh, the name of the kids' school has been localized to Stony Brook Mellanstadie Skola, while the 1992 version keeps the English name Stony Brook Middle School. So for the for the names, uh, there seems to be two different strategies. The 1989 version localizes more, while 1992 keeps closer to the source. Another notable change is how the teacher, Mr. Redmond's title is translated. Uh, as all use of titles have been largely absent from Swedish since the late 1960s, we don't know how to use them. This is a known translation difficulty into Swedish. In the 1989 version, his uh, title is rendered with a lowercase mister and no period, the most common way of uh, writing English titles in Swedish. In the 1992 version, he's called Magister, which means teacher or someone with a master's degree. The 1992 version has chosen a much more archaic form of address than 19. 89, which is also interesting because in general, I would say that the 1992 version is more informal and modern in its sentence structure and choice of words. While the children keep their English names, um, the translation The last six books are again published by Bea Wallström uh, and are numbered one through six and called The Babysitter's Club. The books uh, are from much later in the series, books 50, 54, 55, uh, 58, 60 and 63 and break with the pattern from earlier to basically publish in order. While the children's name are keep their English names, the translation is drastically different from the first two series. Uh, it is very free. And not only on a sentence level, there are additions, restructuring of paradrags, and deletions. 
there are also changes in information, like the characters' backgrounds. For example, we are told Marianne's dad and Don's mom date for ages before getting married, while the Swedish translation states they got married soon after starting to date. To be fair, um, book 30 is where they get married, uh, which isn't translated, um, as the Swedish translation stopped almost 20 books before that. Here are a few translated sentences from the beginning of book 50. I will read um, the source text first. Oh no, cried Marianne Spear. Please tell me you're not going to make that. She was staring down at the health food cookbook I held in my lap. Her eyes were wide with horror. Dawn, I really don't think anyone will want to eat tofu apple nut loaf at this party, she added. And then the back translated version of the Swedish translation is, oh no, exclaimed, exclaimed Marianne Speer, staring in horror at the cookbook I was leafing through. You're not going to serve our guests health food, are you? So children's literature is often categorized as low status literature, which in a Swedish translation context often shows uh, with out-of-order translations of a series, titles not semantically close to the source text equivalent, author's name less faithfully reproduced, and freer translations. So I tried to make a profile for the three different series of the translation as a starting point, and then also added localization, um, so translating context, concepts and places of names, and how English uh, personal titles were handled. And as we can see, the first translation is close to the source text. It is in order. And the titles are sometimes semantically close to the English title, sometimes not. Um, for all translations, uh, the author's name is always correct. For Bonbach's Club, then, um, the translation is close to the source text. Um, the books are mostly in order. We have books, book one and then seven through 11. Uh, the, tan the titles are semantically close to the English title. And for the last translation, uh, The Babysitter's Club, we have very free translation, uh, very out of order. Uh, and the titles are sometimes semantically close to the English title and sometimes not. So the profiles are quite different. And I wanted to see if that was reflected in how much the series was localized and how uh, title, personal titles were handled. But I'm quite not quite done with the research of the last series, which is why they are in um, parentheses, but it doesn't seem to correlate. Uh, though the free year translation and out of uh, order publishing points towards at least these um, correlating. Um, we see that uh, localization happens in Bona Club, but not in Bonbas Club. And we see that English titles are kept, um, which you can see as not localizing, um, but they are uh, not kept in Bona Club, ben, whereas they are both kept in uh, the English and uh, localization al also happens. So this is very much a, a work in progress. So thank you so much for listening. Uh, I hope you found this interesting. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nicole Navarra. I'm presenting today on Young Readers, Textual Difficulty, and Genre. So for those of you who haven't encountered the idea of readability before, uh, books are frequently scored according to various formulas that aim to establish a, re a relationship between a set of textual features and an age range or a grade level. And the ARI or the Automated Readability Index is quite typical in form. As you can see, there are a few textual features here arranged in a sort of argument 
about how language itself becomes readable. After that argument is made, a regression analysis gives us some numbers to put around those features, modifying them to bring them into line with the grade levels that they're supposed to measure. Now, if you're a computational text miner like myself, then you know that we can quibble easily with the precise boundaries of sentences, words, and even characters. And, but that's not why I've started with this measure, even though debating what constitutes a word is always fun. Um, I've put up the ARI because on the surface it looks very much like any other readability formula, but the documentation and the reasoning behind it are a little bit different. So the ARI was proposed in 1967. I'm in this paper by Center and Smith, and one of its novelties was the use of characters instead of symbols. Syl syllables, sorry. Other readability formulas often use syllables to capture how complicated each word is, and but syllables are notoriously difficult to count, even in one's first language. Many contemporary computational methods to count syllables actually rely on dictionary lookups. Characters, when operationalized by a keystroke on a typewriter, are much easier to count. This change was because the ARI was designed for live tabulation on a keyboard. You could know what your document's ARI score was as you typed it. And it was in particular designed to support the production of standardized readable prose throughout, for use throughout the US government and military documents. Now, the AI is one of my favorites, not because I think it's right or good. I mean, it's one of my favorites for thinking about my project, trying to understand readability, and because it makes it so explicit what it means to count things. And its reasons for the choices it makes in its abstract. And these choices are really about mechanical affordances and computation. So they write, this provides for the mechanical tabulation of the required data on passages as they are typed on a standard typewriter. Impulses from the typewriter activate counters, which record the number of letters, words, and sentences contained in the passage. And now it is fun to quibble. They're not really measuring words, they're counting the number of times the spacebar is pressed. And so on. Uh, but that quibbling is made possible because I understand what this measure was designed for. And so I'm trying to ground my project in understanding the relationship between purpose and method. And because with readability scores, it's very easy to get caught up in validity instead. Now, I'm not working on government or military documents. What I'm working on is a database called the Young Readers Database of Literature, assembled in large part by one of my co-panelists, Quinn Dombrowski. The project began by collecting almost anything for young readers, purposefully ignoring the difference between children's middle grade and young adult literature, because the reasoning went, this is a database, not a corpus. Anyone who builds a corpus out of it can bring their own genre definitions as they please. Now, the problem is, uh, depending on who you ask, these things, children's middle grade and YA, they're either genres or their audiences, or maybe there's some special combination of the two, um, or their marketing and advertising categories, or their library shelving metadata. Almost always, though, uh, whatever children's middle grade and YA are defined as includes some sort of relationship to age and to grade, even as it includes conversations about form and content. And so readability metrics, even if I don't necessarily believe in their use in a classroom, become a really interesting way for me to explore this relationship between age and genre and form and content, not as an educator, but as a literary critic. So here is a small sample of readability formulas so you can get a sense um, of what they look like and what they capture. Now, they have a feature set that usually includes characters, syllables, words, uh, and sometimes difficult words, or sentence length. And then they perform various operations on those features, putting them into ratios, finding averages, 
creating percentages, curving things, creating if-then statements, or sampling. After all of that, usually some regression. Right. So these formulas are a lot of fun to pull apart, and I'm sure that looking even for just a moment at these as critical digital humanists, you're coming up with some concerns about what they measure. Well, lots of folks share those concerns. So there are plenty of reasons to be wary of difficulty measures. Most formulas have standard errors of measurement of a grade level or more. Average children don't exist. <laughs> uh, many computational methods and approaches were or are proprietary. They're closed boxes. Easier words have not been found to uniformly improve comprehension. And these formulae don't line up well with each other or with other measures of fluency and literacy. Now, it's this thing in the middle that I skipped over that I want to talk about. These formulas also operationalize different and occasionally competing models of what it means to be read. So they assert an argument about text in addition to asserting things about readers. And if it's my job when I'm in the School of Education to think about readers, as a digital humanist, it is my job to think about text. Other disciplines have done really compelling work on the reader and grade level side. I think it's our job, um, especially if we're going to use these metrics, to think about what these metrics mean about the words on the page. So to start on a whirlwind tour of a few angles this project is taking to explore readability. Using various readability scores as tied to grade level, it is possible to sort texts in the Young Reader's Database of Literature. On the top here, is the ARI grade level score, and on the bottom, the Smog Index grade level score. When you line them up, you see that they don't exactly sort the database in the same way. So if we relied on one of these metrics to build a corpus querying out of the database, our corpus would be caught up in these interpretations of readability, proxy and grade, and audience, and therefore genre, because our genre definitions for YA middle grade and children's literature are intimately tied up with our ideas about what young people are capable of, even as we want them to grow. Now, for each novel in our database, the grade level scores vary. So this is replicating some of the findings of the social scientists cited earlier, but at a larger scale. I have access to more books than they do. As so you can see that the standard deviation for grade level score and between metrics, they're listed at the top. Um, and if the leftmost peak is understandable, the two to the right in the six to 10 standard deviations and 14 to 22 standard deviations require further digging. Now, comparing individual readability metrics against expert authority lists, uh, which is how the regressions are created in the first place, is another way to explore the relationship between readability and genre. Although some of the bins of some authority lists, like awards, um, here the Prince Award, given to books for readers ages 12 to 18, is a little bit large. Um, but it's at this scale, looking at individual titles that we have expertise in, that readability metrics can prompt us to go back into the text with attention to the number of characters, words, and sentences, and see how those are or are not in tension with our understanding of how hard this text is. For example, on the left, I happen to think that speak and dig are both incredibly difficult texts. Um, but the ARI doesn't really agree. Going back into that with that in mind, I might rethink what it is um, that makes dig and speak hard. Unfortunately, always um, in conferences, time is short. So I'd like to set aside graphs, even though they're fun, uh, to offer a few things more conceptually that young readers literature offers to the idea of readability and our attempts to measure it. Now, not all readability metrics are aimed at young readers, but a fair number of them are. The challenge of sorting 
the Young Readers Database of Literature, offers many challenges to the very idea of measurable textual difficulty beyond an individual reader's experience. But first, none of the readability indices mentioned in this presentation have been validated on non-English languages. And contemporary works for young readers often code switch. And it's increasingly a convention to code switch into other languages and to not mark non-English words in English young adult novels with italics. There are more informal languages in young readers fiction too, slang, imagined, outdated, or contemporary, um, and the specific language of genres like science fiction, fantasy, or the genre of texting on the internet. Second, while it's hard to count for reasons explored by Melinda Lowe, Claims about the increasing diversity of representation in young readers' fiction are also claims about an increase in the diversity of vocabulary, schemas, and the background information required to understand text, meaning our attention to what knowledge an individual reader brings with them and what knowledge they'll be supported in acquiring throughout the text renders the so-called common vocabulary lists significantly more problematic, uh, but also more challenging and really interesting to design and think about and test and break. Given all that, I'd like to conclude uh, with two approaches that I'm moving between in the broader project. So the first is a DH classic, operationalizing. If we care about readability as a literary concept, then we can define it operationalize it and measure it using our own measures. We don't need to turn to measures designed for say typewriters um, or like the smog index designed to be calculated easily in one's head. On the other hand, we might also model more specific readers. Cutting edge readability metrics like the ATOS are pretty massive models that build on the feature sets and the validation of metrics that have come before. And they aim for generalizability. I think as digital humanists, we might consider the opposite. So when our work cares about real readers, then the increasing diversity of young readers' literature prompts us to consider modeling more specifically, maybe to even imagine what it would look like to model a single reader with X vocabulary and Y prefixes at hand, uh, because functionally that's what we're already doing. We are modeling a single reader with each of these formulas. We just don't say that. And I think that readability metrics can push us to think harder about the mythical reader that haunts all of our criticism and yet isn't us, right? Maybe turning them from the reader into a reader and one we can point at and model and have a conversation with. So with all of that, thank you so much. I'm so sorry I couldn't be there. Um, I'm just launching this project now, so I would be delighted to receive your comments and questions and thoughts and feel free to contact me. Thank you so much. Hey. Hi, everyone. Um, I am a member of the Data Sitters Club, hence the beautiful dress I'm wearing that Quinn made me. Um, but I'm going to talk about something different today. Um, I'm actually going to talk about Narnia. And just a quick content warning, just because of the content of my talk, talking about bias, I will be mentioning briefly some anti-black tropes. Um, there's a slur on my slide, and there's an orientalized image from one of the um, books. Okay, so I'm not a children's literature scholar. Um, I come at this project out of a desire to intervene in debates about what computer science terms bias, but what scholars in fields like postcolonial studies 
Intersectional feminism and critical race studies have for long decades been critiquing using a far wider and more granular set of terms, including but not limited to orientalism, alterity, racism, misogyny, misogynoir, heterosexism, many more. So the humanities might have something to teach CS about understanding otherness and eliminating bias from language. There is the premise that it's even possible to eliminate bias for a start. But snark aside, it seems like an increasingly urgent task to find ways to make these long established insights from critical theory legible to computer scientists who are trying to do a noble thing in identifying bias in their models and their models outputs, um, but largely without reference to the decades of work from anti-colonial, anti-racist, black, post-colonial thinkers and writers. So, lest this be perceived as a straw person argument, I will quickly put up an article that got a bit of attention within CS when its PhD student author um, first brought it out in 2019. Things have moved on, of course, from then, but I still find it a really telling document for two of the assumptions on which it rests. First, that a concern with social good is a recent development within computer science, and second, that fields that have something to contribute to this are not the humanities, but those adjacent to politics. And when this article first came out, I was so bemused at the response among uh, computer scientists that I, I gathered some of the tweets. And these are random commentators on Twitter, so they're not peer-reviewed proof of anything. But um, I've put them up to indicate something of the invisibility of work, specifically in the humanities. Isn't that why we have economics and political philosophy, says one of these tweeters? So this illustrates something of the problem, I think, in getting CS to even be aware of these long intellectual traditions in the humanities. Um, and putting these connections together seems to me particularly urgent in light of recent developments um, with, say, Reddit, Reddit and Twitter, which have re uh, revealed how much these large language models are relying on sites like this, where a great deal of racist, sexist, and white supremacist discourse is aired. But good news, the digital humanists are on the case. So observing that work at the intersection of black studies and the digital humanities has the capacity to, quote, highlight how technology can further expose humanity as a racialized social construction, Kim Gallen argues that any kind of work about the relationship between humans and their technologies requires attentiveness to the way constructions of human identity are always built on racializing systems. Building on Gallen's work, Richard Jean So and Edwin Rowland, in a fairly recent piece, asserted that, assert that any applied use of computation for the study of culture or history should be prefaced with a racial critique of computation. So these approaches from our field invert those of computer scientists who are on their debiasing mission. Rather than taking a corpus or a model's outputs and tweaking them, a little less misclassifying of black faces as animals here, a little more gender diversity in generated images of respected professions there. These scholars start from the premise that, along with language itself, the machines humans have built are components of the racializing systems that are always already constructing the world around difference. It's bias all the way down. And we will come back to Yertle later. All right, what has any of this to do with Narnia? Let me set the scene for you. Perhaps you have found yourself one day reading an old edition of a children's book aloud to actual children. If you've ever done this, you might have found yourself editing on the fly as you discover outdated or prejudiced language. Perhaps you have gender swapped the famous five, so the girls get to do the heroic parts of the adventure and the boys have to stay behind. Or tried frantically to read ahead with your tired eyes so as to quietly excise or change mentions of gypsies. So this quote I've got on the screen here is from an article um, in which the author has, in the debates about was C.S. Lewis racist or not, he's actually fallen down on the like, side of defending Lewis. Um, it shows that even an apologist for Lewis has to do that editing. But in fact, you cannot just skirt words, to use his term, as you might in reading a book to children to solve the problem of bias. So perhaps you see where this is going. Just as Lewis's novels, which we might think of in terms of parole, are suffused with the logic of racial difference, including it in the imagery, the narrative structure, the stylistic ticks of different characters' dialogue, so too, the language at large, in this case the literal long, is organized around binaries of self and other, as theorized by Frantz Fanon, Edward Said, Gayatri Spivak, Audre Lorde, and others. But while we might not be able to grasp language as a whole, or the black box that is a large language model, we do have a better chance at grasping a smaller system such as the Narnia books, and use those 
to approach the work Gallen calls for, starting from the premise that language is infused with a way of talking about difference that spreads its tentacles, sometimes very subtly, into many other things. So for those who don't know them, here are the individual novels from the seven book series, The Chronicles of Narnia, written by C.S. Lewis, Christian writer and English professor in the early to mid 1950s. The word counts make them too small for any meaningful machine learning analysis, but the small size of the corpus does mean they're well suited to close reading combined with other forms of computational analysis. Stuff you can do with students. So my basic argument about the Narnia books is, in a nutshell, that they provide a useful text with which to do this difficult job with which I began of bridging between critical theory and the humanities and those parts of computer science wanting to do something about harmful language because they are simultaneously overt in the way that they articulate a moral economy of good versus bad by means, for instance, of oppositions between black and white, which you can readily recuperate by let's call analysis, right? But also, they are more complicated than that. These books do not always latch white onto good and black onto bad. Furthermore, there are additional discourses which circulate in the books which are not so readily recuperable via lexical searching, but which, sorry, but in which a little knowledge of literary history and genre does make easier to find. Okay, so what do I mean by both simple and complex? Here on the screen, you can see some sample instances of the lemma WHIT wildcard, so white, whitish, whiter, and the surrounding context. And you can see some of the things it's been used to describe here. Snow, frightened or shaken faces, sugar, salt, lilies, fabric, a beard. And some of these might seem quite straightforward or neutral, but as we'll see, they carry other connotations. Now the villain of this series, who's the stand-in for Satan, basically, in the kind of Christian theological framework that is the, the obvious analogy um, in the books, is the figure of the white witch. And she actually accounts for 35 of the 202 instances of the lemma, which is about 17%. And so she's evil personified, and she's persistently associated with white imagery, all kinds of white imagery, um, much of it in the form of snow. So part of her tyranny is to keep Narnia perpetually in winter without it ever being Christmas, Christmas Western English tradition. But the white witch's whiteness is a troubling whiteness. It's an artificial kind of whiteness, deadly white, white as salt, excessively white. And Uncle Andrew, her evil if somewhat gormless human acolyte, is also connected with whiteness. And there are some images where whiteness is yoked to beauty, but in ways that are cold and creepy and menacing. Now contrast this kind of unnatural or creepy whiteness with good whiteness associated with Narnian characters. And this tends to be portrayed as natural forms of white. So you have a milk white stag, that's the, a magical animal that en ends up leading the children home in one of the books at the appointed time. So very much associated with good magic. Natural fibers, you've got the, the white as wool beard of the king, the, um, the fine white cambric of the princess tunic. And then this last example is somewhat overdetermined. The whiteness of lamb's wool turns into another lighter color, which becomes the personification of good, the lion, Aslan, who's the stand in for Jesus in the books. Which, just to make sure you really get the color imagery, he also scatters light from his mane. Now, these additional shades, so to speak, of meaning are lost if you just search lexically for black, white, or you can even broaden it to like dark or light. If this were a larger corpus, you could search with embeddings or maybe with topic modeling, and you would likely probably pull up um, some of what I've just outlined, um, the, the kind of artificial creepy whiteness versus the natural whiteness. But what neither word embeddings nor topic modeling could tell you is the wider discourses that this doubled form of whiteness um, kind of connects to and is anchored in, the binary between nature and industrialization. So to know about that, you need to know a little something about literary history. So terms like milk, wool, snow, salt, paper, icing sugar, they, like, they don't carry a morally freighted meaning when you, you know, see them in that kind of bag of words context. Um, they seem like a list of ordinary objects or commodities. But until, like, th so that's the case, until you bring them into the service of an opposition worked over at length in English literature, particularly of the 19th century, between nature carrying associations of beauty, freedom, imagination, so forth, versus industry, so ugliness, soul deadeningness, artificiality. Lewis's 
very economically and entirely predictably latching his good characters onto the good side of that binary and his bad characters onto the bad sides. And there are many kind of further connections that you can make from this, and I'll just I'll, I'll quickly sketch one. Um, so the, the nature versus industry binary, one of them is nationalism. So one place this is articulated is a point in The Magician's Nephew, which is the first book in the series where Aslan creates the world. Um, and this character, Uncle Andrew, thinks he has discovered a way to make his fortune by pl basically planting metal bars in the fertile soil and they'll, they'll grow into things. So Uncle Andrew's combination of laziness, vanity, and venality is conveyed by linking his ambitions to the commercial possibilities of America. So you can think of the way these word associations, um, like how they might kind of behave in a conceptual vector space. So vectors for terms like commercial, railway engines, battleships, millionaire, they're all kind of being inched closer towards the vectors for America and Columbus. Um, and the word America is only mentioned six times in this whole series, only once in this specific novel, um, and the only two instances of Columbus are the ones from that excerpt. Now, at the same time those non-pastoral associations with America are being cemented by the books, the associations with nature are not just being made with a generic sense of nature, but with a specifically English sense of the natural world. So an identifiably English pastoral landscape. Um, and you have the city of Tashpan, which kind of acts as this orientalized foil, just in case you, you missed how English the, um, the nature of Narnia is. And so this brings us back to whiteness. Um, only here, white nationalism isn't coded using anything as obvious as black-white binaries. Instead, it's conveyed by imagery that might seem to have nothing to do with whiteness, but is instead intimately bound up with a pastoral vision established as quintessentially English, but only really visible as such if you have something of an understanding of literary history. So, to be clear, everything I've said here would be eminently obvious to children's literature scholars. I was able to find points to illustrate um, my argument pretty efficiently with text searching, but none of these insights required computational text analysis to arrive at them. However, why I'm giving this paper at this conference is that I think they suggest to us avenues we might pursue when we use computational approaches on larger corpora which cannot be easily read by humans. And once we've identified the ways that subtle discursive constructions of nature are connected onto more easily identifiable binaries around color, that might give us somewhere to look um, as we search larger corpora for what I earlier termed the tentacles of bias. So observing how the opposition between good nature and bad industry in urbanization might be latched onto nationalist or colonialist frameworks gives us another set of connections to explore. So I will just say that that's kind of the next steps for this project, taking some of these insights and trying them out on a larger corpus, such as the Yertle corpus that you just heard Nicole talking about, and that's where we come back to Yertle. Uh, so I will, yeah, finish there. Thank you. And yeah, the, the Yertle corpus was named after the turtle um, and all, all of his stacks. Um, all right, so uh, we'll wrap up this session with um, some more from Yertle um, in the form of, of Shakespeare. This was um, a, a bit of a, a strange idea that occurred to me last fall. Um, since Shakespeare is, is pretty much the exact opposite of what I usually do, um, it's English, I usually work with not English. It's um, you know a, a canon kind of text, that's not usually what I do either. Um, but you know it, it seemed like this could be an interesting thing to explore in Yertle, which is just brimming with possibilities of, of things that we can look into. Um, you know, when we have a, a corpus of, or a, a database of, of text at large, what happens when we select out things um, that are adaptations, for instance, um, adaptations for Shakespeare in this case? So Shakespeare is prestigious. Um, and one of the things that I got to thinking about this is, is how much of the like Shakespeareness of these texts that are marketed as adaptations of Shakespeare um, is, is, is functionally marketing. I mean, the fact remains that youth literature is published by adults, it's, it's purchased by adults in many cases, it's policed by adults, um, and if you as an author want to write a story about, you know, two teenagers who fall in love and disobey their parents and get up to no good, um, you know, if you slap a label 
on it and say, this is based on Romeo and Juliet, um, odds are you'll get a better response from the, the people who actually are going to be doing the purchasing than, than if you just sort of run with the story as it is. Uh, so what I ended up doing here was I, I took, you know, Yertle as a starting point, we have 30,000 works of, of young literature, um, and I uh, found 90 works that were identified by readers as being somehow related to Shakespeare. There are several lists on Goodreads, um, you know, related to, um, you know, rewriting Shakespeare or adaptations of Shakespeare or, or things like that. I collected all of those um, that I could find, uh, had to add a few more things to, to Yertle uh, to get this collection, um, but this, this this is what we started with. So you might wonder, what plays are being adapted? Um, probably not surprised that Romeo and Juliet is, is number one uh, fairly significantly. Um, we also have um, more, more Hamlet than I expected, um, a reasonable amount of Twelfth Night. Um, there's, there's some Macbeth, um, <laughs> but there's also 56, uh, you know, re represented by like smaller combinations of, of these works on the left. There are all kinds of, uh, you know, Shakespeare uh, plays are, are sort of finding their way into these different forms of young adult literature. Um, so then there's a question of, of how are they being adapted? And, and this is more or less how I ended up uh, grouping them. Uh, there's the like, linguistic simplification, which is you know, basically the modern play, but made easier for, or the, the original play, but made easier for modern readers to read. So the language is simplified, sometimes it's turned into prose, um, sometimes the language is like, modernized in ways that like, really don't age well. Um, so yeah, never, never try to write a, a book in emoji. One of my, my oldest kid actually um, really enjoys um, a series called LOL Shakespeare um, where the the play is largely transposed into like you know now um, you know 10 year old emoji use which which really like is, is extremely cringe to read um, so there's there's that type um, then there's the adaptation so the story is transposed to a different usually modern time and place it's modern teenagers um, you know dealing with murder plots um, or romance is a little easier to, to follow. Um, and then there's this, this interesting phenomenon of embedding, where there's like a subplot of a school putting on a Shakespearean play, um, and there may be a connection to things happening in the main plot. Um, but like there's, there's a production of, uh, you know, Macbeth somewhere that, that's going to happen at some point. Um, all right. So I thought it'd be fun to, to throw some computational methods of this and see if we can if we can see how they how they how these texts cluster. Um, can we find by looking at these texts computationally, um, you know, where can, can we identify them as, as Shakespearean adaptations? Um, you know, so I, I took I took a selection um, again. Ex pulling a random selection of, of things of, of similar readability level, um, as Nicole described, um, from Yertle. So we have the Shakespearean books and we have the non-Shakespearean books. The non-Shakespearean books are in the sort of salmon pink here, and um, each of the different plays is a different color. Um, and, and so we, we do see some degree of, of clustering here. Romeo and Juliet is, is remarkably separated out from um, all of these, uh, and Hamlet as well kind of groups itself together. Uh, this was a, a PCA looking at all of the words except for the 200 most frequent ones to try to avoid um, any stylometry effects. So, all right, we, we see that Romeo and Juliet and Hamlet are, are kind of separated out. Um, we thought we'd try a biplot to see what are the words that are, that are pulling these texts apart from the other ones. Um, and it turns out that Romeo and Juliet adaptations are likely, uh, at least more than some of the other books, to use the original names. So, um, how do we tell why is Shakespeare? Our theory so far is that it has characters with names like Romeo and Juliet or Hamlet, um, which is not a very satisfying uh, uh, sort of set of parameters for, for determining this. So let's, let's try something else. Um, and and what, we, what I decided to try here um, is something that we did one of our, our data setters club books on, uh, Katya and the Sentiment Snobs, um, where our takeaway from that book was uh, not to use sentiment analysis for literature um, as a way to like look at the plot or to like make any claims about sentiment. Um, and 
I, I, I will stand by this point, and I'm happy to argue in the Q&A about it, for if you'd like to get into an argument about sentiment analysis and literature. Um, dubious word lists with fixed sentiment scores, they, they are a bad way to measure plot, but could they be useful to identify texts that share source material with well-known patterns of emphatic positivity and emphatic negativity? So, um, you know, narrowing the corpus down to the Romeo and Juliet, like, you know, even if... I, I, I don't want to go so far as to say I was looking for like the plot, but we know that there are all kinds of you know words with positive associations that are likely to happen when they fall in love, and there's words that you know with negative associations uh, that happen when they die. So let's see if this works. It does not. <laughs> take take away it, it. It did not really work. Um, you know, I, I took one of the Romeo and Juliet like linguistic modernizations with the original plot, um, kind of like as as something to compare against. And um, if you look at some of these other adaptations, um, even if you squint, it, it doesn't really work. Um, again, taking a different one, it like it just it 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 doesn't work. Um, there's just too much stuff going on here, too much, it, it's not, it's particularly with these adaptations that are transposed to a different time and place, um, there are other things going on, and it's not just a matter of, like, you know, like, they fall in love and they die at the end, like, sometimes they don't die at the end, um, and so there, there go all of your, like, reliable negative words at the end. Um, just, th there's, there's a lot of complexity here that even though we, as humans, would recognize this as, like, oh, it's another Romeo and Juliet, um, it's not as simple as like having these guaranteed like peaks of positivity and troughs of negativity. So, thought I'd try one more thing. Uh, this time I thought we'd try some topic modeling, uh, partly because we have a forthcoming Data Sitters Club book on topic modeling with Xana Schofield, um, which, which honestly has been a, a wonderful process of, of writing this. It's, it's dispelled a lot of my own confusion around topic modeling, um, and I'm looking forward to, to getting it out there hopefully later this summer. Um, and, and the topics, we did, we did a 50 topic model, uh, chunked all of the books into paragraphs, um, and then sort of did the topic model like based on the paragraphs and sort of grouped it back together into books at the end. Um, did a 50 topic model, and I mean, these, these are pretty good as topics go. At least they're, they're, they're pretty human interpretable. You know, we, we have our death topic, we have our, you know, love topic, like that's, that's nice. Um, you know, we, we have the like, you know, physical romance topic. Um, and then we also have, you know, kind of the, the, the bad words and like slang and, you know, that kind of discourse topic. Um, so this wasn't, this wasn't just uh, the Romeo and Juliet books. I also sampled from Yertle uh, a set of uh, books, again, with a similar readability level and um, from the romance category on, on Goodreads. So again, trying to find books that are similar but are not, but are not Romeo and Juliet, or at least not flagged as such. And that's another nope. Um, so I, I actually delayed making these slides until a half hour before the panel because I kept thinking that maybe I'd come up with some good idea or some other way to munge the data so that I would be able to say, like, look, we found a way to make this work, um, and, and I could not. So at 1.30, um, I, I threw in the towel, and, and this was it. So um, I, I put the Romeo and Juliet books, I sort of prefixed them um, to be able to see them together. This is like a, a heat map where kind of like the brighter the color, um, the more intensely the topic is present in that book. And like, we don't really see a lot of, there's, there's, there's no, like some of the books share topics. Um, the problem is that, that the non-Romeo uh, and Juliet books like tend to share the same topic. And the, the topic the books all share is just, it's not a very interpretable topic. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of colloquial English, you know, there's some degree of, I mean, you, you, could, you could see this probably in dialogue. Um, you know, lots of, lots of, um, you know, there's also words about like time and talking and, and things. I mean, there's, but this is, all, this is all the way across. This, this is a topic that is equally in the Shakespeare books and the not Shakespeare books. Um, so this, this was an interesting experiment. Um, it didn't work. Uh, if anyone has any better ideas to try, please let me know. I'd, I'd like, I would love to figure out like what is the method um, that could get us these things computationally that we as readers um, can see. Um, but I'm not sure what that is yet. So if you have any ideas, please let me know. Thank you. All right, so I think the, the three of us will come 
up here and, and sit. And, and as uh, Joanna and uh, Anouk are, are doing so, I'll, I'll note that the, the big concept for this panel was to like put junior scholars and senior scholars and people in all kinds of places and careers in dialogue and you can see what happened. Um, it, it, didn't, it didn't quite work. I mean, we're, we're very grateful uh, to everyone for all the work that's gone into the uh, kind of virtual presentation options, um, but it, it, it certainly uh, leaves me with the thought that, that there, there are other things that we can and should be doing to bring um, younger scholars into this kinds of dialogue and, and these kinds of communities. And um, yeah, in my ACH and ADHO hat, uh, we'll, we'll keep working on that, so. So, questions? Red block. So this one? <laughs> okay, right. this one works. Good. Hello, thank you so much for being here um, and for your interesting presentations. I'm usually running around, I'm also a volunteer, but I was really curious about the last presentation. Um, Quinn, thanks for sharing all these different methods. What is your hope or your goal with with some sort of computational method that does what you're looking for. So if you do end up finding it, why, right? Like why find a method that can do what humans can do? Um, it is cool, but what's, what's behind it? Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, honestly, it's, it's my own curiosity. Um, I, like, I, I want to know if it's possible, um, and if so, what that would look like. Um, I, I think this, this, is, this is inherently um, kind of one of the, the pluses and minuses of, of my particular situation as, uh, you know, digital humanities staff. Um, where like, I don't need to do sort of like groundbreaking scholarship or any scholarship whatsoever, like in a disciplinary field. Um, but when someone comes to me with a problem, like, I want to find out X in you know a corpus that's larger than they can just read with their eyeballs. Um, I like ideally I, I should be able to give them some kind of answer. Uh, so uh, things like this in the data service club more broadly are, are are basically just little experimental labs for me. So that um, someday when when someone comes to me with a question that looks kind of like this, um, I might have some idea for how to wrap my head around it. Um, that's that's loud. <laughs> Um, thanks, that was a lot of fun. Um, I'm really glad you brought up uh, the Narnia books, which I read when I was, I don't know, nine or ten, and I thought, hmm, that metaphor is a little bit too on the nose. One of the things that I think is in youth literature that might not be in other literature is there is an opportunity to deliberately try and teach or deliberately try and normalise, um, which is not necessarily always a good thing. I'm wondering if you have any ideas, uh, other than close reading, of finding that kind of extra layer that gets in either from the author or the publisher or just because it's selection or whatever. Does that make sense? Yeah, so um, funny you should ask this because there's a data sitters club <laughs> book that's pertinent to it. Um, I want to credit some one of our um, colleagues from the data sitters club who's not here, um, Maria Ciceri. Uh, who is our, she is our resident children's literature specialist and she's a, you know, eminent scholar who's actually written on Narnia and I had lots of slides with her quotes on them that didn't make it in. Um, but uh, we had a humorous moment uh, uh, slightly early on in our collaboration where we were surprised to discover the changes between some of the editions and we were like, what does this mean? All these interesting changes and Maria, the children's literature scholar said, very politely, this is a thing in children's literature that you know that there are these changes precisely because of what you identify the pedagogical impulse, the idea that you know children are very particular kind of vulnerable readers. One has to protect them. One has to use literature in a way that's going to you know be productive. Um, and so there's a kind of there's a way in which the, you could read this as benign, but um, in fact, part of Maria's work is on like how children are schooled in like the you know the logic of white nationalism. Um, 
just to kind of connect it back to what I was working on. So in terms of how um, we might like use our computational methods to recuperate that, the op obvious one is to look at the changes between um, different editions. And so I should probably pass to Quinn for that because she did the work on this book. Um, yeah, do you want to talk about that? It, and there, there, there weren't very many, and they only modernized like maybe up through like book 14 out of you know 100 and some. Um, there, there were like there, there was an interesting one from a DH perspective um, where they changed how the character turned on the computer. So in the original one, she reached around and like turned it on from the back, which like I mean you, you wouldn't do that anymore. Um, there was a they they replaced uh, the term uh, thongs with flip flops, um, which I. I you know, I'd forgotten that that was ever uh, a term used for that kind of sandal. Um, you know, uh, one of the characters' uh, hairdo was changed from a perm to something slightly, I think, like just nondescript um, because, like, no one gets perms anymore. Um, yeah, so that gives you a flavor of the kind of things that we found in our corpus, but I think if you were looking at, like, the wider corpus, then there would be some um, fairly low-hanging fruit to be done with, like, the analysis of gender just through pronouns. Um, you know, where uh, you might, like you might see that kind of across the corpus as a whole, but you might also see it between editions where, you know, there might be a little bit of an effort by editors to very quietly change the, the gender of the people who are, um, you know, allowed to be in the adventures, so. I, I have a, a comment for Joanna, actually. So with the, your, your, your slide uh, reminded me that when, when we were working on this project, we didn't have this data, but we now have uh, material from the Anna Martin papers um, for many of the books, not all of them, but like now I, I want to go check out the ones um, where there's like sort of this merging between the, the uh, Ghostwriter and the Anna Martin ones to see like whether there's anything, because we also have like drafts, we have like synopses and stuff, and so we, we have some material that might help disambiguate that. That's kind of exciting. Hi, uh, so I have a question about the last presentation. Um, I was just wondering, uh, because you were mentioning sentiment analysis and topic modeling, I thought your results were really interesting. Uh, I was just wondering which methods you used and if you conducted some sort of evaluation uh, and how you did it. Yeah, so with the, the topic modeling, we were using Mallet. Um, we chunked the, the books, you know, sort of by, by paragraph, and then just tried a couple different numbers of, of topics. The 51 seemed perfectly good um, on the whole. Um, there's, there's, more, there's more things that we'll end up writing up in uh, the, the Data Sitters Club book about it um, that we just sort of borrowed, borrowed for, for this. Um, with the sentiment analysis piece, um, use Sujet. Uh, again, I, I had the code lying around still from, from our uh, Data Sitters Club book that sort of like walks through all the steps and has all the code um, on, on the site. And it was just sort of generating uh, sort of like the default plot, um, the smoothed one, and then the, kind of like the all, all points plot for each of the, the books. Uh, okay. Because... Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm also really interested and uh, do sentiment analysis and topic modeling, but on very different corpora. Uh, but I was just going to suggest that maybe if you were unsatisfied with the results, you might try methods such as BERT, which uh, are not like lexicon based, but are actually based on embeddings and might create much better results. So maybe if you try to compare, uh, you would find something different. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, I mean, the, the word embeddings is, is definitely, we've dabbled in it a little bit. And it's on our list of, of things to, to uh, you know, write up in a future Data Setters Club book. Um. Um, yeah, um, I would also add that if this is something that you're interested in, and I will definitely also recommend it to you. A few years ago, our colleague Emily Franzini was working on uh, examining simplifications of uh, Jane Austen novels. And um, I remember she was using a couple of algorithms, especially for tracing influences and text reuse and so on. Um, so you could look, look up her paper, I don't remember the title, and, uh, and check it out because she had some pretty interesting results with it. It was working quite okay. Oh, yeah, thank you. I, I'll definitely look that up. Um, I, I would really love to figure out like, this, this Shakespeare thing, um, if it's possible. I'm inclined to think it is. I'm just not sure how. Thank you so much for all your uh, very nice presentations and um, 
it's very interesting what you're doing. I'm very pleased to hear more about like translations and um, invisibility of the translator and stuff. I have two questions, one more general. So I did work on a project before in reading lists, school reading, high school reading lists. And I did like a comparison of uh, reading lists in Turkey, which are very top down and reading lists in Austria, which are more a little bit less top down. At least they're not mandatory, but in Turkey they have this list of uh, kind of more or less mandatory 100 works that are predominantly read in, in high schools. And also, Quinn, you also addressed a little bit this, um, I don't know, publishing market dimension there in youth literature. So I was just wondering if you could generally reflect uh, on this question of the influence of like reading lists and the influence also of market related kind of questions and how they kind of lead to this kind of, uh, they, they move these texts um, into like edu uh, educational environments. And then my second question is just like a, 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 sh a short question I would have really liked to ask to Nicole uh, Namora too, who gave a great presentation. So I was wondering about the application of the readability algorithms for youth books, because I know the application of readability algorithms to make uh, text simpler to read are more and more in use. And I was just wondering if that's, maybe you know, uh, maybe not, that that's something also that's happening to, to books that authors or publishers actually use uh, those algorithms to simplify books or adapt them for the readability index. But again, maybe that's a question for uh, Nicole Namura, but thank you. Yeah, thank you for those questions. Honestly, uh, both of them, Nicole, would be able to answer better, um, I mean, given given her um, education, PhD. Um, try, trying to channel her to, to the extent I can, at least on the first one, um, one of the, the challenging and frustrating things in terms of building corpora and, and book lists um, with regard to the US education system is that, like, there are no standard reading, like, there are no standards. There, like, curriculum is, is decided, like, at the state level, at the local level, it's just all over the place, um, and you know, we, we look enviously on um, you know other countries that have like standard curricula and things where you could say, okay, these are the books we know we need to look at. Um, sometimes we end up using awards as a proxy for that, um, but like award books are kind of like inherently exceptional in a certain way. Um, so that's, I mean, a, a lot of other work on, on on youth literature like has been focused on these award books, which is part of why we wanted to um, have Yertle because it gets at like all the stuff that would never win awards. Like all of the like you know talking unicorn books, all of the like dancing fairy books, all of the like you know yeah yeah b like b boys off on a mystery like kinds of things like these these series and things like that. Um, so yeah, I mean the like it, it would be great to be able to have more data, and we've we've also recently been looking at like lists of banned books in in certain states that that have developed a penchant for banning books. Um, like, like, yeah. I can jump in just briefly to say this doesn't, this is not a list, but um, uh, Ed Finn at Arizona State has done work on how Amazon's, um, like, you know, books other people have read uh, data, um, and this is back some time ago when it was much easier to scrape it, so he's done work on how that lines up or how you can kind of see the pattern of the curriculum behind those, because think about it, you know, you've got a school reading list, you go on, you click on To Kill a Mockingbird, and then, you know, five million other people are also buying, you know, the six other books on the reading list. So I think there's a Lit Lab pamphlet, a Stanford Lit Lab pamphlet that he's read, he's written on that, which is adjacent to what you're talking about, not quite the same thing. Yeah, in, ter in terms of the, the readability metrics, like, I, I would be fascinating to talk to publishers about like how they use that or don't as, as part of their process. Um, you know, certainly, like I, I think all, all I can speak to this is, is my own experience as a parent, um, where like kids, like know their reading level in this weird sort of like alphabetized like graded way and like there's even like a sense of gatekeeping where like if you're a kid who can read like you know a level G book like you know maybe that level N book isn't for you um, this is something like I, I, I constantly try to like fight with both my kids and their teachers with like yes you absolutely can read an N book like go do it let's do it um, but yeah no um, I, I'd be yeah happy to, to pass that along to her is there anything in the chat from Nicole? 
Okay. It's, it's still pretty early on the West Coast. <laughs> so we have three responses here. Who was first? At Thank you all for an interesting panel. I have a question for Joanna. Uh, I was very excited to see your um, results or your little triangles, um, your translator clusters. And then you said you believe it has to do with cultural differences, basically, right? In translation or st translation um, standards in different countries. And I think that might play a big role. But do you think? Like, um, because language co combination can also influence your results. So do you have a way of distinguishing between like linguistic um, differences between languages and uh, more cultural uh, influence? Oh, thank you. That's a super cool question. And um, um, I would say it depends, like we can examine some linguistic features for sure. Uh, we can also compare uh, the situation for this collection of books with other collections of book and books and how translations behave uh, uh, also when it comes to different uh, genres or different collections. So this comment that um, I think it might have something to do with, with the um, translator training, this is my hypothesis. I I would love to examine this more. Of course, I cannot make it uh, um, like a, a certain statement right now because there is not enough data on it. Uh, and in fact, there's been quite little work done on stylometry and translation studies. And most of the, um, of the studies that were done were done on Polish, English. So just like a few languages that were close to um, to, to the few people who were doing this kind of research. Um, but it definitely seems like there might be some, some impact of uh, translation, uh, translator education. Also because um, a few year, a few days ago, uh, Jan Rybicki also had this talk about uh, using ChatGPT and DeepL as a translator and comparing it with actual translators. And he also had this observation that there is um, there are differing levels of uh, intervention that translators deem acceptable in various countries. Like um, his examination of uh, French translations into English would point out that sometimes, actually, quite often, translators might be tempted to shorten the sentences or omit some information, um, which in some language settings will be considered a huge betrayal on the part of translator. Um, I also, as a reader, and now this is like a totally anecdotal experience, but uh, as a reader, um, I've also observed it um, by reading some books in various translations um, that the level of translators um, intervention seems to vary. So I'd love to examine this, but so far it's just a hypothesis that, uh, that I'd love to um, revisit with other data sets as well. Um, okay. Um, yeah, thanks for this panel. Um, it's really exciting to see DH, or exciting to see DH finally take off in Chilin's issue as well. Um, if, if someone is going to the CHLA conference, they will have a reverse panel. So they will have DH in the Children's Literature Association conference. So it's really cool to see that in both fields, the fields are finally connecting. Um, but I had a question. I, I was intrigued at the end when you said this was an experiment in bringing people together, so young scholars and more advanced or more experienced scholars to, to connect them. Um, so I was wondering why, why you thought this experiment failed. Um, how it did so and what we could do to foster or create those connections between um, young scholars and more experienced ones. Yeah, I mean, we've we've been working with a large and, and kind of increasingly diverse group of, of people on the Data Sitters Club. I mean, we have you know, a guest data sitter for, for many of our books. Um, you know, I, I have a chance to work with grad students, like, you know, that's probably the, the largest group of, of folks I, I work with. And I was hoping that we could all come together in person for the panel and, and be up here. Um, but I mean, the, the it's, it's a perennial, you know, challenge with the like cost of the conference, the cost of travel, um, you know, Adho does have, have bursaries, um, but 
you know, I, I, I think this is this is still a, a work in progress, and this this particular conference has been a big step forward in terms of like I think this is the first time it's been possible to present without physically being there. Um, but there's there's still there's still more work to do, um, you know, be it like virtual opportunities. Um, I mean, I think Zoom Zoom has its advantages, but like isn't quite it. Um, we've, we've all been doing a lot of Zoom conferences, and like it really is is not the same, especially in terms of like fostering kind of like the the informal dialogue, you know, the questions and answers, and things like that. So, um, yep, still we're 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 figuring this out um, as an organization, as as all organizations are, and um, there's there's still there's still more work to do, I think. Um, yeah, just on the Shakespeare, I'm I'm full of dumb ideas. One of the ways they do narratology in drama, and you, you might have already thought of it, is they do a lot of graph analysis, so a more a, a, a robust way of trying to detect adaptations might be to visualise plot in terms of a graph of nodes that appear in certain numbers and have certain kinds of interactions between them, um, and that might be easier than maybe looking for sentiment or looking for linguistic features. No, that's that, that's an interesting one. Like yeah, character networks, that actually could that that could do it. I don't know. I'll, to, I'll I will I will try it and report back. <laughs> Thank you. We. I, I, I think to, Toma's Toma's uh, <laughs> pulling the plug here. So yeah. thank you everyone for coming, and uh, <laughs> please stick around for the closing ceremony. <laughs> <laughs>